All right, hello, and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale, the Real Seeker. And uh, today, um, continue on with this sh uh, sh part one, uh, last, sorry, part with part two of my two-part series on David Hume's take on miracles. So in part one, I kind of summarized using um, my old prof, uh, Class Cray, and his, his kind of lecture slide notes and stuff on David Hume's argument against miracles. Remember that was in two stages there. He gave miracle, relying on testimony of miracles is impl impossible to believe in given our experience of the, um, uh, uh, given our experience of the laws of nature as being immutable and inviolable. And then in fact, point of fact, even if this wasn't an issue, uh, the testimonial evidence that we have is garbage and rubbish. It's very poor. And we looked at uh, Richard Swinburne's response against that, um, kind of taking on Hume's definition of uh, what a miracle is. And um, then he kind of said, but there is an exception, right? Um, we can kind of go through, uh, there are special kinds of miraculous testimony that would overcome even our direct experience about the laws of nature and that sort of thing. Um, and then after that, I kind of gave some general background knowledge on a specific field in epistemology known as the epistemology of testimony. Uh, so what are the three, you know, the main positions? I said there's three positions, testimonial skepticism. So testimony, testimony or testimonial evidence is guilty until proven innocent. You just can't believe anything. That's totally ridiculous. Obviously we gain knowledge and knowledge is transmitted through testimony. Uh, so that was just dismissed. And then we have the two main positions in the debate which is the reductionist, which is David Hume. You have to have positive reasons to believe versus the anti-reductionist, which is what I or Richard Swinburne would take or Christian theists in general would take saying, testimony is innocent until proven guilty. You have to have uh, undefeated defeaters to dismiss testimonial evidence. Other than that, it's justified in the same way any other source of evidence is from perceptions, memory or inferences, reasoning and stuff like that. Um, okay, so with that, now I want to get into my personal assessment of David Hume's argument on miracles in particular. So let me just bring up the screen here, my PowerPoint slides. All right, cool. So uh, Dale's e. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. So my evaluation of Hume, Hume's argument. So remember from part one that Hume's definition of a miracle is um, two parts. Number one, it's not due to any natural force, process, cause, or mechanism. Secondly, it is due to a supernatural cause, specifically God. Um, and Hume's argument came in two parts, an in principle or stage one argument, and an in fact or stage two argument that takes the form of, well, even if a thing, but in fact type argument. So that's sort of the form that Hume's argument takes. Okay, so just recapping. So stage one or this in principle argument of David Hume's is premise one, the experiential evidence for the laws of nature is much stronger than any possible testimonial evidence in favor of miracles could ever be. Premise two, we should proportion our belief to the evidence. Therefore, conclusion, the evidence strongly suggests disbelieving any testimony concerning miracles that there could possibly be. Um, okay. Stage two of his argument then, this is the in fact argument. He says, but in point of fact, the actual real world testimonial evidence that we have for miracles, it sucks. So look, we, you know, in, in stage one, he says, Look, even if in principle you had good testimonial evidence for miracles, say I'm 99.99% convinced that a miracle took place based on your testimony, still in principle, I still reject that because I've got 100% proof from my experiential evidence or 99.9999999. It's, it's higher. It'll always overwhelm. That's the point of Hume's in principle argument. No matter how good the evidence is, if it's shy of 100%, it's always going to be less probable than um, your experiential evidence for the laws of nature being immutable and inviolable. 
But in this in fact argument, Hume is here saying, but look, you don't even have good evidence. The testimonial evidence isn't even 99.99% proven. It's more like 10% or something. It's, it sucks. It's pathetic. And he gives four reasons as to why he thinks the actual testimony in the real world for miracles is garbage and rubbish. So number one, he says, look, the actual witnesses are not good enough. Secondly, people have motivating factors to lie or motivating psychological um, factors that influence them to lie about miracles in particular. Hey, I look cool. Oh, I witnessed this strange, fantastical beast. I, I saw Hercules battling this. I, and I, you know, I traveled to India and oh, you won't guess what I saw there. I saw people floating and levitating. Ain't I cool? Isn't that a great story? So this is a psychological story, right? We like hearing uh, campfire stories. We like hearing uh, people going to Scotland and oh, you, you saw the Loch Ness Monster? Oh, tell me all about that. Yeah, yeah. And we exaggerate, we embellish, we just plain make up and lie BS. Uh, in order to seem cool to our peeps, to our fellow uh, co comrades and uh, colleagues and friends or whatever. Finally, thirdly, uh, sorry, thirdly, uh, David Hume says, look, all, it, it's never the proper civilized, and what he means is white, uh, people that uh, really uh, see these miracles. It's always the ignorant and the barbarous peoples and nations you know, these savages, they're primitive. They don't know any better. It's over in India. Those, those guys don't, aren't civilized. Uh, or in Africa, you know, the traditional religions or tribe, tribal religions, these guys are primitive, uncivilized. They're too stupid, uh, in other words, to understand. Um, as well, yeah, I won't evaluate it, but that's what David Hume, one of his third, his third reason for thinking that the testimony that we have, real life sucks for miracles. You never get it in England or Scotland where he is. You know, we've moved beyond that. We're scientific, we're civilized. And finally, contradicting religious miracle stories. So look, yeah, you've got miracle stories for the resurrection of Jesus and Christianity. Muslims have miracle stories of Muhammad splitting the moon in half. Uh, Hindus have their own miracle stories, uh, so on and so forth. These cancel each other out. Therefore, you have to dismiss all of the evidence, testimonial evidence for miracles. It's all garbage and rubbish. You throw out that baby with that bathwater, according to Hume. Okay, uh, and then therefore, obviously, the experiential evidence is even hyper strong relative uh, to the testimonial evidence for miracles, and you should disbelieve it in real life. So that's Hume's argument. Um, now, what do I say by way of assessment? So the first main assessment that I want to give, uh, you can see Hume's argument, the abject failure. Those aren't my words. Um, the first argument that I have is from scholarly consensus. Now, it doesn't matter if you are an atheist, an agnostic, a Christian, a Muslim, whatever. If you are a professional philosopher with a PhD, you know that Hume is full of trash. Uh, the scholarly consensus, most philosophers that specialize in this area and humane scholars of all persuasions, doesn't matter, atheist, agnostic, Christian, theist, don't matter. We all agree Hume was wrong. He screwed up his arguments, garbage and rubbish. And it is, in the words of a uh, uh, famous Oxford philosopher, secular philosopher of religion, Dr. John Ehrman, he wrote a book called Hume's Abject Failure. He failed in his argument, utter, utter failure. Um, and it, he gives the argument against miracles published by Oxford University Press, uh, kind of a secular, very big wig uh, uh, place to get your book published, right? And look, most all scholars agree that uh, David Hume's argument is really garbage. It, it's not logical, it's irrational, and only a fool would be persuaded by it today. At best, scholars try to find, pick and glean or reinterpret stuff uh, to get something out of Hume's argument. And we're going to find out a little bit more about that in a further objection. But at most, we usually get what's come to be known as Hume's maxim. That's the best we get. Everything else is obviously wrong, obviously fallacious. And even humane scholar, an atheist turned deist, and I'm going to include a video clip of him when he was an atheist. 
he was a humane scholar, Dr. Tony Flew or Anthony Flew. Even he recognized Hume's argument was bunk and utterly fallacious. Um, so yeah, um, that's my first main argument against this is scholarly consensus. Everyone agrees today. Everyone with a PhD who's in the know in philosophy and specializes in the area of identifying miracles would say Hume sucked. His argument, throw it in the garbage, throw it in the trash. It has historical value, but from a strictly philosophical or logical standpoint, it's wrong. Okay, um, so let's get into my first specific objection. So this is based on premise one, um, based on definitional disputes and false presuppositions that Hume has. So essentially, remember how Hume defined a miracle. Right? He had those two criteria, it's not due to natural causes, and it is due to a supernatural cause, namely God. Um, and essentially, he, those two criteria amount to Hume, as he, as he kind of says, as miracles are really transgressions or violations of the laws of nature. And for him, the laws of nature are immutable, they are inviolable. So by definition, miracles are impossible. If miracles are defined as violations of nature, the laws of nature, and the laws of nature are inviolable, so they're violated and not violated, violated uh, at the same time, that's logically contradictory, that's impossible. That's what Hume's doing here. He's trying to be provocative and he's using these uh, languages, he's treating the laws of nature, he's kind of equivocating, right? He's treating the laws of nature as though they're like legal codes and by saying that miracles are transgressions or violations, he's wanting you to think criminals. Oh, oh, okay, so someone's violating the law. Uh, that's bad. It's got this negative connotation to it. And that's deliberate on Hume's part. Um, now, in terms of the definition here, um, I want to note that in the first place, you can refute Hume even by taking on this ludicrous definition. Um, as biased as it is, uh, Richard Swinburne, for example, didn't at, at least didn't disagree with the two criteria that Hume gave. He would obviously disagree with it being a violation or something like that. But um, he refuted Hume's argument on his own terms, so to speak. He used Hume's definition, said, no, we can still rely on miraculous testimony. Um, and, but uh, yeah, obviously using this definition, uh, it by default kind of as violations of nature, it rules out and rules that all miracle claims are so improbable that uniform human experience alone uh, simply over will always overwhelm any and all miracle claims. It's he's cooked the books. It's impossible to ever believe in the testimony of a miracle, so to speak. And therefore he's begging the question. He's got, he's, he's uh, engaging in viciously circular reasoning here um, based on some of his uh, false presuppositions that I'll talk about. You know, his anti-theism is obvious, pretends like he's neutral or, or an agnostic starting point. No, it's, it's blatantly atheistic. There is no God. And that assumption defines how he defines miracles and governs the way he argues. Um, and it's important to note that, look, only really deists, um, and atheists in Hume's day would have been so foolish as to say that merit, define miracles as violations of nature. Traditionally, though, theists have had other definitions. So in the ancient days, people like Thomas Aquinas in the medieval period or Augustine during the late Roman Empire and late antiquity, they would have seen, uh, they would have seen, Augustine, for example, would have even admitted, sure, they appear like they're violations or contrary, to the laws of nature or, or nat the natural world, um, but they're not because miracles are above, they transcend, uh, they are beyond uh, nature and that sort of thing. And there, because there's a God, of course he can do that. So they would deny this biased definition that miracles are violations of the laws of nature, rubbish, say. Uh, some of the most brilliant thinkers in human history and pretty much everyone, even in Hume's day, uh, he got pushed back on this definition and he was utterly destroyed, I would say, by the theists responding to this biased definition that he gave. Um, and obviously most philosophers today have also rejected Hume's definition. 
Um, and it's based on certain presuppositions that he had. Um, okay. So here's what I'm saying. So the reason for this universal rejection among professional philosophers, irrespective of their worldview, is due to Hume's false, or at the very least unproven in this argument, his assumptions regarding the non-existence of God and his view of the laws of nature as being immutable or inviolable, according to what's called the Newtonian world machine. So this, the Newtonian world machine was a position uh, given by deists first, and Hume just copied them. So in a way, he's kind of copying these betters, so to speak, um, in terms, uh, and they viewed the world, the universe as a machine, the world or the universe as a machine, right? It's like a clock, it's got parts, tick, 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 and they all move in terms of gravity, um, and everything's fully causally determined. And the universe itself is a closed system. You can't have any inputs from the outside. Um, and that's what Hume is assuming this. He's begging the question. He's, he's just uh, saying, assuming this in his understanding about the experiential evidence for premise one, right? If you don't assume the Newtonian world machine, if the universe is not like a machine that's inviolable and immutable, it can't, someone from the, a machinist from the outside can't input something new into the system. Whereas Dr. John Lennox, Oxford mathematician and Christian apologist says, you know, you know, you have this idea of, well, if I put uh, a toonie in a drawer and another toonie in a drawer, toonies are uh, Canadian coinage. It's two bucks, $2 for us. It's a coin uh, called a toonie. Um, if I put a toonie in a toonie, another toonie in a, in a drawer and then fall asleep, and I wake up in the morning, look in, and there's only one toonie in there. Well, I don't uh, automatically, I don't just go, oh, well, two plus two equals two now. Um, no, two plus two equals four. You, you wouldn't say, well, the laws of mathematics and nature have been broken. No, the laws of Alabama have been broken, or the laws of the Canada have been broken. Obviously, some thief came in from the outside, entered that closed system from the uh, sorry, that open system from the drawer, he opened up that system, reached in, took out a toonie and left. Uh, goodness knows why, is the, why this thief is so stupid to just take $2, steal two bucks and leave. Um, you know, usually thieves want a little bit more money or take as much as they can get. Um, but that's, that's the thing, right? So the, the Newtonian world machine would view that drawer as a closed system. There is no thief. You can't have a thief outside of the drawer. All that exists is that drawer. And therefore, everything in that drawer is like a machine, working like a machine in a system. Nothing can violate those laws within that closed system. Um, now, obviously, this kind of view of the universe is uh, really outdated. So number one, in ancient times, ancients tended to view the universe more as like an organic, a living organism type deal. Uh, and you get things like the Gaia hypothesis, for example, among some pagans and stuff like that. Um, and more modern views take different views. They, they see the universe as more like an information system or a computer software program. And, you know, there's been various analogies to describe the universe. We, we no longer view the, Newtonian, the universe as a Newtonian world machine. And there have been several reasons for that. You know, quantum physics or relativity theory, these have really destroyed the atheists and the skeptics' foolish claim that the universe is just some closed system and the laws of nature are immutable. They're not capable of revision. We're not capable of learning anymore. We know it all. And the laws of nature are absolute. No, philosophers are smarter than that today. Um, now you might have some popular scientists or sci scientific popularizers who aren't that smart. I mean, you have a brilliant Stephen Hawking. My goodness, he's a brilliant scientist, but he's a dumb philosopher. And that's proven in his books. If you read The Grand Design, uh, he's just atrocious uh, from a philosophical standpoint. Or Richard Dumboy Dawkins. Ooh, Hawkins and Dawkins. Yeah, they're, they're, don't quit your day job in science because you wouldn't make it in philosophy. I'll just say that. Um, okay, so uh, moving on. So in terms of the laws of nature today, um, there are basically three predominant views about the laws of nature in the philosophy of science. So number one is what's called the gnomic necessity theory. So I think this would be the closest to the Newtonian world machine. This is what the closest to what David Hume can get. That's a viable option today. And this sees yet yeah, the laws of nature are prescriptive in nature. They're, they're 
prescriptively imperative. They're necessary uh, and inviolable or, or immutable. Then there's the regularity theory. So this is where you get people like John Lennox and that, and they'll say, well, the laws of nature are just generalized descriptions and specifically mathematical descriptions of the way things happen in the universe. So they're merely descriptive in nature. They're not prescript. The laws of nature are, are not prescriptive. They're not things that impose, you know, the way things have to be in the universe. That's the way Stephen Hawking kind of views the laws of nature as though they're a thing that actually exists rather than just mathematical descriptions of the way actual things like subatomic particles or planets or whatever behave in the universe. The regularity theory would say, no, no, the laws of nature aren't things that can prescribe the way things are. They're just descript mathematical descriptions of what things do. Okay, we look and subatomic particles regularly do this. Okay, this must be a law of nature. You know, we look at the, the motion of the planets and okay, uh, this must, the general theory of relativity seems to describe the way these things are moving and operate. So it becomes a law of nature. So that's this view. Then there's the causal dispositions theory, which just says, look, everything that exists, every substance, uh, property thing and or heap uh, has a nature or an essence. And this includes certain, uh, well, not a heap, but um, okay, so I screwed that up. But everything that exists, every substance at least has a nature or an essence. And that includes certain causal dispositions. They're disposed to do or not do something in any given set of circumstances. So they react or affect things in specific ways. And the laws of nature, again, are just descriptions of the way of the essence of certain things, of these causal dispositions within things. So obviously, I take uh, two and three. I'm kind of a combination on that front. Um, I think that, yeah, they are generalized descriptions. So obviously there's nothing inviolable or immutable. We update our descriptions of the laws of nature based on new observations all the time. And there's nothing prevent, it's an open system. It, it's, you can have revision, um, you're allowed to have anomalous events and stuff like that. And perhaps God can input a miracle into the system anytime he wants. Well, here's, what about gnomic necessity theory then? This is again, the closest. Well, the laws of nature are inviolable, immutable. They're prescriptively necessary. Well, doesn't this, this is what Hume is presupposing. So it, I thought you said his view is outdated. Well, it looks like these guys have a modern view of it. Well, no, because if you look, and I'm gonna include papers on my blog on all these theories for you guys. Uh, so check out my blog at realsecretministries.wordpress.com. But actually, if you look at what gnomic necessity theory says, they're not as foolish as Hume, even though they say this, they're lying. They really say, no, but they come with implicit exception clauses or exemption clauses. They, they implicitly say, well, look, these are just inductive, uh, inductively arrived at laws of nature. They can always be updated and revised. And the reason scientists have done this is, you know, they always say science is provisional and stuff like that. These laws of nature are provisional and they can be revised. Why? Because in the 20th century, they got these atheist scientists got a rude awakening with relativity theory, destroying Newtonian physics. Um, I shouldn't say destroying it, that's an exaggeration, but nonetheless, we, we know that Newtonian physics isn't exactly correct. It isn't technically proper. Uh, relativity theory is a better explanation. So we've revised the laws of nature accordingly. Um, even if we still use Newtonian physics, it, it, Newtonian physics is roughly good enough to be to still be practically used in certain contexts. Uh, also, quantum theory that has been a revelation to scientists in the 20th century. My goodness, things are weird. Quantum entanglement, quantum uh, quantum physics is just uh, it's it's kind of an automatic refutation to David Hume right there, and and kind of provides a real world evidence that he was a fool in advancing this Newtonian world machine type analogy for the universe and that sort of thing. So yeah, even, even gnomic necessity theory, which is the closest theory that's a viable theory today, um, I, I would argue it's not viable, but there are professional philosophers that take this view today. Um, even they would admit, no, all these laws do come with implicit 
exception clauses or uh, clauses for revision and, and stuff like that. They are, they are provisional, they're inductive. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, so that's just what I said. Um, okay, cool. So moving on. Um, now, in terms of definitional disputes, I'm still uh, disputing David Hume's definition of as a violation of nature and his two criteria. You know, it's not caused naturally. It must be caused by God supernaturally. I think that these terms, the supernatural versus natural divide that only came about in the Enlightenment, the, these terms or categories of events didn't exist prior to the 17th or, or uh, 18th centuries there when Hume was, was writing. Before that, there was just events, some more frequent than others, some more remarkable or extraordinary uh, as others. Some served as signs, whereas others didn't, signs of God, uh, whereas others didn't. That's all the Bible understands. The Bible, when he said supernatural back in biblical times, they'd be like, huh, well, I don't, I don't understand. Um, so I think that this leads to a lot of irrelevant debate. I mean, how many times have I, atheists and skeptics on, on the internet like to pretend that, oh, well, I know what the natural is, but I've never heard of supernatural as a category. You haven't, to use the, the words of Darren Lute from the SNS boards, you haven't demonstrated that the supernatural is a thing. Um, yeah, the, he actually said that, people. But um, anyways, the, the, the point is it's controversial and I think unhelpful. I don't think it's necessary and I think it's irrelevant. So I have a different way of defining miracles that I think works. Um, and it's something that I uh, am interested in. I think I have a unique idea here. And hopefully if I get into, okay, I won't say that, but um, okay. So anyways, my definition of miracle would be, look, it's a remarkable or extraordinary event that it e that is either directly or indirectly intelligently designed to occur uh, by God, for a given specified reason or purpose, and which at least in principle upon discovery would serve as a sign or wonder to one or more human beings. And again, either naturally or supernaturally caused, that doesn't matter to me. Miracles can be naturally caused. God can use natural laws that he created supernaturally to uh, and maintains um, to do miraculous events and use those as signs and wonders for human beings. Um, so yeah, um, that's that. Um, so, okay, great. So how do I go about identifying a, an event, a mir mirac sorry, a miracle as I've defined it here? Well, this is where I think we have to turn to intelligent design theory and most helpful in my op opinion is Bill Dembski's specified complexity criteria. So I think that if a given event can be proven to fulfill the criteria for specified complexity, we can uh, in turn infer from that rationally that well, this event was intelligently designed and uh, intelligently designed by who? By God as a miraculous event for X, Y, or Z purpose and it serves as a sign or wonder for human beings. Um, so yeah, so in terms of going into more details on that, I was going to uh, put a clip from one of my previous shows where I go into a lot of detail about specified complexity, intelligent design theory, and how that relates to the identification of miracles of God. Um, just to save time, I'm not going to do that, but I will link in my blog to my previous show. It's about an hour and a half. It's very, very detailed and on these criteria and it, it will explain everything as well. I've written a 21 page blog. So I'll include that attachment on the blog for this show as well. So if you're interested in getting more details about how I define and identify miracles of God based on specified complexity, check out those sources and it'll give you a lot more detail. Okay, so for now, moving on. Potential objection number two. So this is the only objection to premise two of Hume's in principle argument. And it's basically comes from the fact that Hume assumes that evidentialism is true. So remember premise two, we should proportion our belief to the evidence. Sounds fairly obvious, commonsensical. Who on God's green earth would object to this? Well, 
uh, there are such people, and I know them uh, in some cases personally. Um, so yeah, you know, as we saw in the part one show, number one, da David Hume is an evidentialist, so he adheres to a position known as evidentialism in epistemology. So what is evidentialism? It's just a position that says we epistemically ought to proportion our beliefs or the level of belief or the degree of credence, right? To fit the strength and or weakness of the evidence in favor of the truth or falsity of that given belief. So if you picture a line 50-50 right in the middle, picture a straight line, and then 50% is the agnostic mark. I don't know whether to believe, I don't know whether to disbelieve this, I suspend judgment. Anything 51% to 100% would mean you would believe that the proposition is probably true. And depending on, say you're at the 80%, oh, well, that's pretty strong. Um, whereas if you're at 95%, even stronger still, very, very strong. But if you're at the 55%, well, it's sufficient. I believe the proposition is probably true, but it, it's weak, it's weakly held. Likewise, on the other end, when you disbelieve a proposition, if you have anything 49% to 0% means you disbelieve the proposition. And you, again, fit that to the strength or weakness, in this case, of the evidence, right? So uh, how strongly has it been disproven um, kind of thing, right? So if you say, well, I've got so much evidence that the, that the sky is not red, I disbelieve that the sky is red, um, I can see it with my own eyes. That's my evidence. So I'm 100% I'm convinced, or maybe I'm 99% in case my eyeballs can't be trusted. I'm living in the matrix or something. Um, my belief, I'm 90, I have a 99% degree of credence uh, or a level of belief that the sky is not red. I disbelieve that the sky is red. Um, other things you might disbelieve, but it's a lot weaker. You're six, only 60% convinced that the proposition is false and that you know, that the sky is red or something like that, or, or sorry, that, um, I don't know, what's another, that, um, I can't think of the examples off the top of my head, but you know what I'm saying. So you have another thing that you disbelieve, but your evidence is a lot weaker. So you're only 60% convinced that that thing, uh, that the, uh, that you should disbelieve that proposition. Now, unfortunately, Hume and his argument simply presupposes the truth of evidentialism. He does nothing to prove it um, or argue for it in his paper that I'll be linking to on my blog for you guys. Um, and he doesn't even grapple with other views. So what are some of the other views? So um, some people uh, would take a what's called a pragmatic encroachment theory to epistemology. Uh, so for example, Dr. William Lane Craig uh, kind of uh, got into a recent controversy when he said on his show that well, when it comes to Christianity, I would lower my evidential bar. So I wouldn't follow what Dr. Richard Feldman calls this principle of proportional belief, where you proportion your level of belief in Christianity being true, for example, uh, based on the evidence. You know, so he, he says, let's say the evidence is, I'm 30% convinced that Christianity is true based on the evidence. It's a, it's a failure. Uh, well, then you should only be 30% convinced uh, under evidentialism, you should only be 30% convinced that Christianity is true, and you should therefore disbelieve the proposition. But pragmatic encroachment theory and what Dr. William Lane Craig was saying is, no, 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 look, in addition to that um, evidential bar, right, we also have to figure out the sufficiency threshold bar as well. So most people would think, well, Look what you just said, Dale. Look, 51% to 100%, you believe the proposition is probably true. So 51% would be that sufficiency threshold. That is sufficient for me to believe and proportion my belief accordingly on that front. Um, that's what an evidentialist would presumably want to say. Um, but pragmatic encroachment theory could, and William Lane Craig was saying, no, it should be much lower than that. 30%, I, I only need 10% evidential proof or warrant to believe that Christianity is true. I'm at 30%, so I'm a believer in Christianity. 10% is that sufficiency threshold. That's sufficient amount of evidence for me to believe the proposition. Okay, well, why on earth is 10% that the sufficiency threshold? It's based on pragmatic or practical 
uh, concerns, the practical considerations encroach upon the evidentialist theory and the amount of evidence we require to believe something. You know, practical, I mean, look at if Christianity is true, you've got heaven. That's tremendously pragmatically important. It, not only in this life does it contribute to your health and well-being, it allows you to teach your kids true objective morals, not atheist subjective morals that are meaningless and irrelevant and quite depressing, depressing to be honest. Um, no, you, you don't have to do that. Um, because of all those practical benefits of believing in Christianity, both in this life and in the afterlife, an eternity, an in, potentially infinite amount of pragmatic benefits, geez, uh, you give me 11% evidential proof and I'll believe that thing. It's so practically beneficial. Um, by contrast, atheists and skeptics typically try to say that, no, it's the opposite. Under pragmatic encroachment theory, um, and this kind of shows the hypocrisy of a lot of atheists and skeptics online who are critiquing Dr. William Lane Craig because they go for pragmatic encroachment theory when it's convenient for them as well. And they will say, well, look, um, Christianity is so important, it's so impactful that that sufficiency, evidential sufficiency threshold is way higher than 51%. I need absolute proof or I need proof beyond all reasonable doubt before I would believe in Christianity. So they would put the evidential sufficient at like 95% or something. You know, you have to give me 96% level of credence based on the evidence, uh, you know, evidential proof before I would believe in Christianity. Based on what? Based on the pragmatic uh, circumstances or considerations involved. Um, so I think they're kind of hypocritical when they go after William Lane Craig there. But that's just an example of how that would work. There's also moral encroachment theory. So, you know, some scholars, it's the same thing as pragmatic encroachment, but instead of just allowing practical considerations to influence that sufficiency threshold, it would be specifically moral considerations that would do that. And there are other, uh, other epistemology theories. Dr. Liz Jackson, for example, takes a view of practical considerations. If you see her show on Pascal's Wager uh, that she did on Real Seekers, or she's done it elsewhere a bunch of places, right? So there are, there are other views. Um, I think there's also knowledge first epistemology and stuff. I'll, I'll cover maybe those um, general epistemology positions in a future show, but uh, the point is, Hume is just begging the question here and just assuming that evidentialism is true. And he hasn't done the groundwork to prove that these other theories aren't true. Now that said, um, I disagree with people who take these other views. I am an evidentialist. I am like Hume. I think Hume's right. And I take that strict view. 51% you believe, 49% you disbelieve, and below you disbelieve. Um, so I would agree with evidentialism and, and therefore I'm agreeing, I have to agree, yeah, we should proportion our belief to the evidence. As Dr. Richard Feldman puts it, that we have that principle of proportional belief. The wise man proportions his belief to the evidence, that's it. Doesn't matter about practical considerations, doesn't matter about moral considerations, we follow the evidence. Um, so I, I fully agree with this premise. But uh, I just wanted to raise this as a potential objection. If you disagree with evidentialism and go for another theory, you might object to premise two here. Okay, so uh, let's move on um, to my next objection, going back to premise one. But I'm just going to take a quick break here. Uh, still recording, okay. Okay, so picking up on where we left off, uh, so, so yeah, I was just covering my objections to Hume. Um, so in the first place, I gave general objections from scholarly consensus. They're all against Hume today. Uh, secondly, I kind of looked at definitional disputes. How do we define a miracle? Is it a violation of nature? Do we accept Hume's two conditions uh, in terms of the natural versus supernatural divide? And I said, nope. I think that there's disputes there and I disagree with uh, Hume's criteria. Um, but even if you do agree with his criteria on that front and his definition, you have people like Richard Swinburne, who I presented in part one, who still say that we can believe in miracles based on testimony um, or certain types of mir miraculous testimony, regardless of what definition you go with, even if you go with Hume's definition. Um, 
Then I covered an objection to premise two based on evidentialism. And I said that there are differing views. Again, I'm going to post up papers in the blog of those varying views for you guys. Um, so yeah, now we're going to continue on with my next objection. So we're going back to premise one again, based on more false, unproven assumptions on David Hume's part. Um, and that relates to something we talked about in part one. So remember the debate. So premise one is the experiential evidence for the laws of nature are much stronger than any possible testimonial evidence in favor of miracles. Uh, and, it, and stronger than they could ever be, even in principle, according to Hume. So Hume here is assuming the truth of what's become known as reductionism in the epistemology of testimony. Uh, and he's assuming that or begging the question against anti-reductionists like me or Richard Swinburne or most philosophers in the epistemology of testimony today. Um, and as I mentioned in part one, David Hume is actually the founder of reductionism. Uh, you know, reductionism is basically, there are three positions, as I said. So there's testimonial skepticism. No one in the field of epistemology of testimony takes that view. Uh, actually, let me just share the screen here for you guys so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay. All right, cool. So Reductionism versus anti-reductionism. Testimonial skepticism is basically dismissed. Um, and this is, these are three positions regarding how is knowledge transmitted through testimonial evidence from a testifier who knows something and then transmits that to uh, a hearer. Uh, and then they gain knowledge of whatever proposition was testified to them. So how does it go from a knowledge transfer from a speaker to a hearer? And <clears throat> Testimonial skepticism is a position that nobody, virtually nobody holds today. It just means, well, testimony, you don't gain knowledge from it. it it's guilty until proven innocent. You shouldn't believe any testimony. Um, nobody goes for that. Obviously, we gain knowledge through testimony. And we know that. We have plenty of examples of that front. So really, the real debate in philosophy today is between this reductionism versus testimonial anti-reductionism. So just a recap. So testimonial reductionism requires that knowledge may only be transmitted from a testifier to a testifiee if one has, if the hearer has independent positive reasons that are reducible to non-testimonial sources of evidence, memory, perceptions, or inferences, or reasoning, uh, reasoned out conclusions, and that sort of thing, for thinking that the testimony is reliable. Only then can we believe that can we gain knowledge from testimonial evidence. And Hume does interestingly provide three positive global reasons to think that testimony is generally reliable. Remember, uh, Class Cray mentioned there's the power of memory. Uh, so our memory faculties tend to be generally reliable and we use that to testify about things or people use their memories to testify to us about stuff. Secondly, we do have a general, human beings have a general tendency to tell the truth. If you count it, you know, everything, oh, what I ate for breakfast, oh, I'm happy today, I'm, I'm wearing a red shirt today, you know, nine times out of 10, or eight times out of 10, human beings will testify to the truth of something. It's only in rare cases when there's a certain motivation or something going on where we lie, where we bear false witness. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> And then thirdly, um, we also have a tendency, a psychological factor to feel ashamed. There's a social cost if we get caught in a lie. So therefore we're afraid to lie and therefore we'll probably tell the truth. So these are Hume's three reasons for thinking that testimony is generally reliable. We have positive independent reasons, uh, remember reductionism, to believe in testimony in general at least. Um, Okay, and remember, there are two fundamental types of reductionists. There are the global reductionists and local reductionists. Global reductionists require just general positive reasons, such as the ones we just outlined from Hume, to establish the general reliability of testimony. Um, now, one thing I will say here is that I think I made a mistake in part one. I said that Hume would fit as a global reductionist. I actually think 
uh, he would fit in more as a local reductionist because he's localizing that miracles, in particular, you need positive reasons specifically about miracles to trust testimony of miracles kind of thing. He, it, you know, he gives these three criteria for thinking that testimony in general is reliable, but that doesn't mean he automatically believes the um, believes testimony in miracles. No, you need independent positive reasons for believing testimony and miracles are reliable. So Hume would qualify as a local reductionist, but quickly, what are these? So global reductionists just require, as I said, the general reliability of testimony. And we can refute this, right? Because number one, it's too onerous to prove. Um, how on God's green earth do you non-testimonially prove that testimony in general is reliable in order to Sorry, in order to do that, statistically, one would have to be exposed to a non-random, wide-ranging sample of all testimonies and all reports that have ever been given in human history. Uh, but not only that, also to a non-random, wide-ranging sample of um, the corresponding facts to compare that testimony to see, does that correspond to reality? Remember the correspondence theory of truth that most philosophers and I go for. This is just ridiculous. This is way too demanding. You, no one has to go through this. It, it just leads to an implausible testimonial skepticism position. It's, it's impossible for any human to ever get that much data to prove that testimony is generally reliable. Um, you know, we're, we just don't have the inductive resources to, to make that kind of an inference. But secondly, there's also a question in philosophy. There, there is a question. Is there even an overall fact of the matter in terms of general reliability? It, most philosophers say, no, I don't think there is, right? Because look, certain types of testimony are more reliable than other types of testimony. That's what David Hume says, right? Testimony of miracles is, uh, tends to be unreliable in his mind. Uh, testimony of what uh, what you know, what way uh, is the proper direction to the pizza hut or something that that kind of testimony of giving directions tends to be reliable. Um, so a lot of philosophers will deny global reductionism and say that there is no fact of the matter regarding the general reliability of all testimony, you know, as, as though it's one kind of unitor, unitary category of um, reliability or, or testimony or something like that. No, you, you have to localize them. You have to separate it. You have to evaluate the localized types of testimony and determine, as, are they generally reliable, or are they not, within those categories, right? And obviously, Hume says when it comes to the category of miraculous testimony, unreliable. Okay, so great, what about local reductionism then? Um, can Hume assume this? Local reductionists, they require non-testimonially based positive evidence for believing the testimony is reliable, for the particular report in question. Um, so what are some problems with this on this front? Um, well, obviously, in the first place, I would say that there are two reasons to think that local reductionism, needing positive reasons for accepting the reliability of testimony about the particular reports in question or the particular types of reports and questions, um, I don't think that's necessary, uh, a necessary criterion. And we have two counter examples here, right? So the first are children. For an abs we know with an absolute certainty that young children obtain knowledge testimonially. Um, for example, a two-year-old who might lack the sophistication to reason and make inferences. Hmm, my parents tell me X, uh, my parents are my parents are generally reliable, therefore I believe X. No child of two years old is doing that. Come on, skeptics, come on. Um, they're not perceiving anything and they're not relying on memory, but yet a child may know not to touch a hot stove burner because they'll get hurt just through testimonial evidence alone, just through their parents saying, don't touch that, you'll get hurt, it's hot. Immediately that child, that knowledge is transmitted from the parent to the child. They believe the testimony alone. They don't have positive independent reasons for believing that, that particular report is reliable. They get the testimony. They have no undefeated defeaters. They believe. 
And they, and we would all say, yup, that little child, that little kitty, he got knowledge. The second example is knowledge, uh, ga us gaining knowledge through testimony when we have an insufficient knowledge base about the testifier and stuff like that. We get knowledge about directions from strangers. We know nothing about these people. Are they liars? Is he a criminal? Is he a rapist? Who is this guy I'm talking to? We don't have to know. We don't know. We don't care. But this would be necessary under reductionism, right? Especially local reductionism. You would need to know what's the reliability of this test testifier. But yet we don't know in often cases when I'm asking for directions to the local pizza pizza hut or local pizza pizza or whatever, I, I ask a total stranger. They say, oh yeah, turn this way. We believe them. And in fact, we come to know that the pizza pizza is there. We gain knowledge despite not having independent positive reasons to believe. So this supports the anti-reductionist um, or anti-reductionism position in testimony. That's the position I think is true um, because yeah, we, what does anti-reductionism say? Look, um, no goodness, did I not, uh, one second. Okay, uh, so yeah, I didn't do it. So I'll just tell you then. So anti-reductionists, what they say is, look, testimony is, is a fundamental basic source of justification or warrant or knowledge. Um, we gain knowledge automatically by default. You believe, just believe the testimony unless and until you have an undefeated defeater for the truth of that testimony. Only then would you disbelieve testimony. And I think that's right. That's true to how we live. Uh, and it's obviously proven in these counter cases here. We don't need po independent positive reasons to believe in the reliability of either testimony in general, global reductionist, or locally in terms of a particular report or particular type of report. We don't need that. It's not necessary. And that's proven through this child and stranger example. Um, so obviously, yeah, I, I think that not only has, uh, can we object to premise one on the grounds that David Hume just assumes that reductionism is true um, and he doesn't provide any argumentation for it or justification. So we can provide an undercutting defeater for premise one. What's more through these arguments that refutations of global reductionism that I just gave those two, and then these two uh, um, refutations of local reductionism, I think we've proven that anti-reductionism is the true position on, on the epistemology of testimony. And that means we actually have, I've just provided a rebutting defeater. Remember, un undercutting defeater doesn't prove, wouldn't prove that anti-reductionism is true. It just says Hume hasn't, we're not justified or uh, warranted in believing in reductionism yet. And until you prove that, your premise can't, we have to be agnostic on your premise. A rebutting defeater is stronger. I've proven that it's a fact that anti-reductionism is true. Therefore, your premise two, your premise one is false because it uh, is founded upon reductionism. And I can prove that it's a fact that reductionism is false. So I think I've provided a rebutting defeater here against premise one um, in terms of Hume's take on test testimonial evidence and its value. No, it it's not true, uh, as premise one says, it's not true that experiential evidence for the laws of nature is much stronger than any possible testimonial evidence in favor of miracles could ever be. No, because anti-reductionism uh, says, no, testimonial evidence is equal to experiential evidence. They're both, they're all equal, memory, perception, reasoning and inference, and testimonial evidence are all equal sources of evidence, at least uh, at face value and potentially, right? They are both basic, they both provide basic justification or epistemic warrant on a fundamental level. You believe, you get testimony, you believe it. That's your justification, that's your warrant. Just like, you know, phenomenal conservatives, what people say, look, it, when you're perceiving a red ball in front of you, you believe that there's a red ball in front of you unless and until you have an undefeated defeater uh, that defeats your belief. So you, if you see a red ball, you would believe that there's a red ball there and you would know that there's a red ball there unless and until you have an undefeated defeater. Like say your doctor says, oh, look, I gave you some drugs and you're now, 
that caused people to hallucinate. Well, now you have an undefeated defeater to go, I don't know if I'm really seeing a red ball. So you would lose that knowledge only once you receive that undefeated defeater. And that's the way a lot of epistemologists see these basic sources of evidence. You know, when it comes to reasoning, you trust it until you have an, a defeater. Uh, perceptions or memory, you trust it until you have a defeater. With anti-reductionists, they're just saying it's the same deal with testimonial evidence. You trust the testimony until you have an undefeated defeater to disbelieve it or to doubt it or to distrust it. And I think that's the proper position. If that, and I think I've proven that through my examples. If so, if you think that children do gain knowledge through testimony and not through positive independent reasons based on memory, perception, or reasoning on their part, then you agree with me. It, reductionism is not necessary. Anti-reductionism works. Testimonial evidence is on an equal par unless and until you have undefeated defeaters. Now, it is important here, I, I don't have the slide up, but um, David Hume does provide what for what he thinks are undefeated defeaters. So even if we um, think that um, anti-reductionism is true, Hume, is, Hume will still, as we're going to see, he's still going to have a way to come back at that and say, yeah, but we do have um, undefeated defeaters, right? So sure, you can just believe the testimony of miracles at face value, you know, that you're an anti-reductionist, cool, I'm a reductionist, whatever, I'm wrong, you're right, let's pretend for the sake of argument. So you get this testimony that a, a miracle claim happened, and you believe it. Well, guess what? You believe it unless and until you have an undefeated defeater. I'm Hume. I've got four undefeated defeaters for you. And we're going to take a look at those a little bit later on. Um, so yeah, that's my, my take on that uh, objection based on the epistemology of testimony. And I think that's kind of a unique contribution that I haven't seen, at least online in many places, applied to the question of David Hume and miracles. So I hope that was interesting to you guys, not boring. I, I'm a geek. I, I kind of geek out on stuff like this, and I think it's interesting. So, all right, cool. So let's move on to my next objection. And this is basically Swinburne's argument, right? This is Swinburne's argument against premise one. And I'm not going to re-go over it. I, I already covered it in detail in part one. But just remember, Swinburne thinks that Hume's, uh, he assumes Hume's loaded definition of what miracles are and his two criteria. And yet he says, but there are still some cases of mir miracle testimony where that evidence is so strong, it outweighs even our strong experiential evidence for the uh, inviolability or immutable nature of the laws of nature. Um, and if you remember, that's where we got into the distinction between repeatable and non-repeatable events. Um, and, and, you know, Swinburne's argument there about how he connects that to God. Um, I'll let you guys go to part one to recap that. Um, but here, here's sort of a quick recap. So look, in terms of the first phase, look, there's a very good evidence in favor of a law of nature. Premise two, a law of nature predicts that a given event E would not occur. Premise three, that event does occur. Um, uh, so, so that would refute that it's, okay, the, the first part of Hume's thing, it's not uh, a magical trick or something like that. Natural law as we know it can't explain it. But then in premise three, Swinburne adds, and that event is not, is not a repeatable counter instance to the laws of to that law of nature. So this goes against, okay, the skeptical, if the skeptic can't uh, prove that it's some kind of natural explanation or whatever it is, you know, the example of levitating, maybe there's strings holding them up. We've refuted all those naturalistic explanations. So it's not a law of nature. Uh, it con this contradicts the law of nature or violates the law of nature to use Hume's language. Again, Swinburne assumes Hume's language, right? Uh, or definition there. Um, but the skeptic has an out. He can say, yeah, but the laws of nature just need revision. Um, so this is uh, this counter instance here of this guy levitating. It's just an anomaly and we need to revise the law of nature or something. Well, Swinburne, if you remember, he said, no, you, if it's a repeatable event, then you would do that. If it's a not, if it's a non-repeatable event, if that same event wouldn't happen in the same circumstances and we can prove that or know that, 
so it's a non-repeatable counter instance, then you go, no, supernatural miracle. You're destroyed, skeptic. Um, so yeah, um, and Swinburne said, argues in his paper, again, that'll be on my blog, uh, that testimony can in principle establish this. And he's got several examples. He, he's even written a book on Jesus' resurrection. He thinks it's 97% proven. Um, so yeah, premise four, there's no plausible modification or revision to that law of nature that satisfactorily explains it because it's not repeatable. And then five, the law of nature predicts successfully in all other cases or events in terms of the occurrences or non-occurrences. So that's related to that non-repeatability. Uh, Swinburne has a second part, uh, again, I, that's in part one, where he kind of connects, okay, well, given we have this supernatural event, uh, how do we link that to being a miracle of God, an event caused by God in particular? And that's where he gets into the prior probability factors of, well, what if it's the case that we have no evidence that God exists? Well, we can prove through analogy reason likening God to a human agent um, and in the case where we actually have evidence or at least some evidence that God exists bada boom bada bing we would expect God to do these supernatural miracles in certain cases uh, so that's his argument to there okay uh, next objection for Hume is based on his faulty methodology and this is again related to premise one so all of my objections I've had one objection to premise two um, and again, I don't even believe that. I think that evidentialism is true, so I believe in premise two. All of my objections are based on premise one here. And I'm just going to take a quick, uh, I'm going to take a bit of a break before I get into objection number four. So let's uh, stop sharing the screen there. And all right, hello and welcome back. Uh, so. Uh, I want to pick up from where we left off. So I think I covered uh, my objections to Hume, uh, premise one and two so far, uh, based on a lot of different factors. And where we left off, I was covering the different positions, the reductionism versus anti-reductionism position in the epistemology of testimony. And <coughs> just want to pick up uh, with the next objection. So let me just share my screen again. So, okay, cool. So this is my next objection to Hume's faulty methodology. And again, this is related to premise one. Basically, experiential evidence outweighs the, any and all testimonial evidence. <clears throat> now, as we saw, this is based on Hume's uh, biased assumptions, anti-theist, doesn't believe in God, and he has this Newtonian world machine. But what's interesting here is that Hume's methodology, premise one, is incomplete. It's not good enough to make that overall probability judgment. He can't say that, oh, it's vastly more probable that our experiential evidence for the immutability of the laws of nature is overall more probable relative to the overall, pro the sorry, probability that the testimonial evidence proves a miracle took place. Why? <laughs> Well, probability theorists uh, have proven mathematically that Hume's argument is utterly fallacious and wrong. Mathematically proven fact. If you as an atheist or skeptic believe premise one is true on the basis of Hume's methodology here uh, and his way of evaluating probabilities, you are a fool. You are the equivalent of someone that believes one plus one equals eight. That's uh, how dumb you are. It, um, now, obviously, I understand people are ignorant about probability calculus and Bayes' theorem and math and that sort of thing. But look, the reason I'm speaking so strongly here, math doesn't lie. It's mathematically proven, 100%, absolute proof. You cannot deny it that Hume's premise one is false. His argument is wrong because his first premise is incomplete. Now, what, what on earth am I talking about? Why would prop statisticians, PhD statistician, doesn't matter whether you're atheist, agnostic, everyone agrees um, on this front. And this is why the majority of philosophers uh, think that Hume's out to lunch today, even humane scholars and atheists and stuff. Well, Bayes' theorem and probability calculus proves this undeniably. Now, I want to say up front, it's not totally fair because David Hume made his argument against miracles 
uh, before Bayes' theorem or the before the probability calculus was invented or discovered, rather discovered, I would say, uh, math is discovered, not invented. That's my position on that debate. Um, um, you know, obviously, as Christian theists, I think that we're thinking the thoughts of God after him, so to speak. Uh, totally irrelevant. Anyways, the, the point is here, so this was invented or discovered after David Hume, and in large part by people like John Stuart Mill as a response to David Hume's take on miracles here. But what's going on here is that Hume's argumentation requires that one must reject even the most reliable testimony of any and all highly improbable events, regardless of whether they're natural or supernatural, doesn't matter. You've got to reject them. And that's ridiculous. No person with a functioning brain in the world would believe that. And it's a popular saying now. I remember my one of my favorite shows was The Mentalist, and he was an atheist, uh, kind of a Richard Dawkinite type person. And he would always say, and he was right to say this, highly improbable events happen all the time. Huh? He believes in testimony of highly improbable events, David Hume would say, you're a fool, according, if he's consistent in terms of his premise one, we would have to de deny rare or anomalous events all the time. So for example, let's take, William Craig gives this great example of a news report recording, hey, the winning lottery number is 7492871. Do you believe this testimonial evidence or not? David Hume's argument would say, no, you've got to disbelieve it. You can't believe that testimonial evidence. That's highly improbable that the news uh, would report that um, and they would select that specific number. It's probably like one chance in several million that the news would get and then report that number for the lottery. Highly, highly improbable. So, you know, basically under Hume's notion here, even if the news Let's say we could prove they are 99.99% proven to be reliable testifiers. You know, we believe their testimony, they're always reliable 99.99% of the time. Even still, because one divided by several million is way, would be um, outweigh and overwhelm this 99.99%. Uh, therefore, we would have to reject the news's claim about that the lottery. Winning lottery number is the 7492871. We could not believe that testimony under Hume's way of thinking. This is nonsense. <coughs> so what is it that probability theorists have done to show this? And essentially they've conclusively demonstrated that one must not only take into account the probability that the news would announce that given uh, that number given it had been picked, Right? So that might be one chance, that number being picked one chance in several million, very, very highly improbable. But you also have to compare that and contrast it with another conditional probability. What's the probability that the news would announce that, um, announce that number given they got a different number in the lottery? And that is highly, highly improbable, even more improbable. It's probably one chance in a trillion. So therefore that overwhelms. And because on that basis, it's extremely improbable that the, that the number 7492871 that the news reported is false testimony. That must be the number. That is very, very probably the number that they got. <coughs> and therefore, you should believe the reliable testimony from the news on the lottery numbers. Even though it's highly improbable, the contrastive hypothesis that the news reported that winning number, despite them getting a different number, is even more improbable. And on that basis, probability calculus, that's how we evaluate miracle testimony. What's the probability of the alternate hypothesis? We have to compare and contrast the probability that we would get this, uh, that, uh, sorry, the probability uh, that we would have, um, the hypothesis that they got this number given they reported it, uh, or and or that and a miracle took place given it's being testified to compared to relative to as a ratio the probability that that miracle didn't take place and or that the news would report that number given that they didn't get that that lottery number when they did the, the random balls or whatever is it whatever it is they do to get the numbers yeah so that's the proper way additionally 
Hume also screws up big time in that he, his premise one only looks at the intrinsic or prior probability under Bayes' theorem. That's the, he only looks at that, number one, he only looks at that one factor, the prior probability, and he uh, ignores the prior probability of the opposite hypothesis of the falsity of that hypothesis. Um, so that's a problem, but additionally makes a second problem. He, he totally ignores the explanatory power hypothesis uh, probability of the hypothesis and its opposite and or its thing. So the explain, we need to look at the uh, explanatory power probability, explanatory power probability of um, the fact that we would have this evidence given the hypothesis is true, given that a miracle occurred. And how is that compared to the hypothesis that we would have this evidence given that a miracle did not occur? you've got to compare that explanatory power as well. So looking at, this is what philosophers call the odds form of Bayes' theorem, right? So you, this is what you want to get, the ratio of the posteriori probabilities, remember, after evidence, after experience. So this is saying, well, what's the probability that the miracle is true given the evidence that we have as a ratio divided by or as a relative to the probability that a miracle did not occur given the evidence that we have. To figure that out, we have these two ratios or two components. So number one, you have what is the prior or intrinsic probability that a miracle would occur? This is what Pre Hume looks at. He just looks at this component here in his premise one. That's it. He skips. He doesn't even know because the probability calculus didn't exist in his day. It was invented after him. <laughs> And in response to him, uh, what's the prior probability that a miracle did not occur in this case? What's the intrinsic probability of that? You have to have that ratio, the ratio of the prior probabilities. You can't just say, well, this probability is very low. Yeah, but this probability may be even lower. Remember that lottery example, right? There's one divided by one million chance that that specific lottery number would have been uh, retrieved given they reported it, but there's a one divided one out of a trillion chance that they would have reported that number given they got a different number. That's even lower. So the ratio here would be very high. Hume just ignores this part. Secondly, Hume altogether bypasses the explanatory uh, power comparative probability, saying I'm sorry about that. Uh, Quick delay, let me get back into Bayes' theorem slide here. Okay, cool. So as I was saying, so Hume only, his premise one only looks at this intrinsic probability that the miracle occurred. It ignore, totally ignores the hypothesis, intrinsic probability of the opposite hypothesis here. And secondly, I was also saying, Hume also ignores the explanatory power um, probability or ratio here. So in this part of Bayes' theorem, this is looking at conditional probabilities, right? So it's saying, what's the probability that we would have the evidence that we have for this miracle, this testimonial evidence and, and or whatever else, given a miracle actually occurred, given that the miracle hypothesis is true, is true. Uh, sorry. And then how, what is that compared to, again, the conditional probability that we would have that same evidence, the same testimonial evidence or whatever else it is, given the hypothesis is false. In other words, H2, given that a miracle did not occur. And you need to get that ratio times the ratio of the prior or intrinsic probabilities. And that together tells you what the ra overall ratio between, well, what's the probability of a, the hypothesis that the miracle is true given the evidence compared to the probability that a miracle did not is not true given that same evidence. And when you get that ratio, that's where you decide. Is it a two to one probability? In that case, it's more probable than not that you should believe the testimony. Is it a five to one ratio, seven to one ratio? If you get that, if, if seven to one, then you should believe the testimonial evidence even above your ex pitiful experiential evidence about the laws of nature or whatever. Because what, even if you have a really low prior probability here, 
this may be even lower and or these may be sufficiently high to overwhelm this low uh, prior probability or intrinsic probability for H1. And therefore you have it overall, you've got seven to one ratio or a hundred to one ratio, and you should believe the testimony in that case. Uh, likewise, after you do the calculation, it may be that these factors are, are insufficient and maybe you'll get a ratio of one to seven or, or two to 200. In that case, yeah, you should disbelieve the testimony for the miracle. That's according to probability calculus and Bayes theorem. That's how you evaluate a te the testimonial evidence for a miracle. And by the way, for any event, doesn't matter whether it's natural or supernatural, mathematics doesn't lie. This is the way you do it. David Hume was ignorant, totally ignorant and oblivious of the mathematics. I'm right, David Hume's wrong. Uh, premise one, throw it in the garbage. It's incomplete. It at best, even if I grant it as true, all it does is say, well, this, the prior probability that of H of our H1 or hypothesis one, namely that a miracle took place, you know, Jesus rose from the dead or Muhammad split the moon in half. That's very low. That's very, 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 very improbable. One out of 1 million or something like that, whatever it is. Uh, given our experiential evidence for the immutable nature of the laws of nature, it doesn't matter because this could, the prior probability that a miracle did not occur could be even lower than that. Secondly, the explanatory prior uh, power probabilities or the likelihood ratio, as it's called here, could be so high given the evidence that we have that it simply overwhelms any and all low prior probabilities about uh, miracles taking place, and therefore our overall ratio is more than is high, is uh, more probable than not, seven to one, sixteen to two, whatever it is, um, or sixteen to one, whatever you want to say, right? So that's the way that works, right? It, it's just it's mathematically impossible. You are an ignorant fool, and David Hume was an ignorant fool in accepting premise one and thinking that that meant we can't believe uh, in the truth of the, uh, the testimonial evidence for the miracle claim. No, it doesn't follow. We need all of this, these factors to get the proper overall calculation, the proper overall probability. Do we believe that testimonial evidence or do we disbelieve it? So I just wanted to, I hope that's clear. Um, I'll include videos in the sources by Will and Lynn Craig Maybe he's a better explainer than me and he'll explain it better, but uh, that's my best take. Uh, okay. Okay. My fifth objection, again, to premise one. Uh, and I, I'm a bit clever here. So was David Hume a rhetorical wit or an illogical twit? Uh, so that's going to be uh, ironic and funny, funny in an ironic way in a second. But um, <coughs> so I mentioned nobody believes in Hume's nonsense today in terms of his argument against miracles. However, there are people like Bart Ehrman or scientists, people like Richard uh, Dumboy Dawkins there, and they will try to argue for what's called Hume's maxim. So what is Hume's maxim? Uh, they'll say, well, you got at least this right. Um, or, or, you know, a lot of times they'll turn it with Bart Ehrman, they'll turn it into a methodological constraint or principle of some, some sort, right? So they'll say, Look, I, I don't know the philosophy. William Lane Craig, you're going on about Bayes theorem. I'm a dunce. I don't understand math. I'm stupid. I'm just going to dismiss what you're saying. Um, but I am a historian. I'm not stupid there. There I'm smart. And I know historiography. The, the historical method, by definition, assumes Hume's maxim. And it, it assumes, by definition, miracles are the least probable historical explanation. So therefore, historians, they're, they're not even, they're constrained methodologically, not metaphysically, but in terms of their methods, they can't even consider a miracle. Because no matter what other naturalistic explanation you look at, that's automatically, by definition, more probable than considering the miraculous explanation. That's complete horse rubbish, in my opinion. Um, that's a debate for another time. I will include that debate, Dr. William and Craig versus Bart Ehrman. That's one of my favorites where they get into the weeds on that specific issue. And I think William Lane Craig really takes Bart Ehrman to task on that front. Um, 
But anyways, the, the point is here, what, what is Hume's maxim here? And it says, look, no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony is, is, is of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the event which it endeavors to establish. Now, many uncritical or non-thinking fundy lay atheists and skeptics, and unfortunately some fundy lay atheists from a philosophy perspective who tend to be PhD scientists today, they blindly accept this maxim and they don't really realize how foolish they are for doing it. Uh, you'll see this expressed in like Carl Sagan saw, for example, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You'll hear this, all, that is the stupidest thing anyone has ever said. It, it makes no sense whatsoever. Well, it makes sense in one, in one way, right? So in one way under Bayes theorem, if you have a very low prior probability, well then that would require um, evidence, the explanatory power probabilities to overwhelm that, right? So there's that kind of way, but that's not what they're saying here, right? If you look at the words, the testimony has to be of a miraculous nature. Extraordinary evidence. On the face of it, this sounds foolish. What, what do you mean? Testimony can't be miraculous. It's just natural. I can give natural testimony of a miraculous event, but my giving you the testimony is a miraculous. What, do you want the words to start coming out of my mouth like a comic book or something? Is it, you want a supernatural miracle? Is that what you're asking for, Hugh? Ridiculous. So, uh, extraordinary evidence? What the heck do you mean by that? What, you want evidence that glows in the dark or something? What are you talking about, atheists? Come on now, come on. This is obviously foolishness and false. What is it that we need in real life? We need sufficient evidence. Going back to Bayes' theorem. Again, we, if we have that lower prior probability, well, how does that compare ratio-wise to the prior probability of the falsehood of the miracle hypothesis? And how does that relate? Is it overwhelmed by the ratio of the conditional probabilities for the explanatory power of the hypothesis that a miracle is true versus the explanatory power of the, of the hypothesis that the miracle didn't happen? You know, the miracle, given the evidence we have, the miracle didn't, the miracle didn't take place. That could be so high that it overwhelms any and all prior, low prior probability factors. Um, so yeah, this is just ridiculous, right? It makes no sense. As I said, mirac testimony isn't miraculous. What, are you, as an atheist and a skeptic, are you truly saying what, I have to have magical words coming out of my mouth that, oh, there was a miracle or something and you see the literal world words formed ex nihilo. Come on now, come on. Um, you know, and I, I love I love using with Sagan saw the extraordinary evidence. What what do you mean? Does it glow? Uh, that's me stealing Mike Lacona. He's much more clever and witty wittier than I am. Um, but that you know, like what what does that mean? Obviously, what we're looking for is sufficient evidence, sufficient to rationally believe the testimony. That's what we need as philosophers and logicians. Um, but that's totally irrational given that Bayes theorem. All one needs is sufficient evidence to say it's more probable than not. That, that top figure, the probability of the hypothesis that a miracle is true given the evidence is higher than the probability, uh, the overall probability that um, the hypothesis is false, that uh, a miracle is false given the evidence that we have. If you got that seven to one ratio, that's sufficient. If you got that two to one ratio, that's sufficient. Um, if you have a one to three ratio, that's insufficient. That's all we need. We don't need any of this uh, woo talk about extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence uh, as, as if there is such a thing or that, you know, the testimony itself has to be even more miraculous than the event of which it's testifying. Miraculous testimony, come on now, no. Uh, makes no sense. It's ridiculous if you think about it. So I would say David Hume proved to be an illogical twit on this front. And this is ironic. Why? Because David Hume, uh, in his papers and on miracles and his writings on miracles, he lambasts Christians and innocent theists who were much more intelligent than him in terms of on this front specifically. And uh, well, that's okay. I'm going too far. Let me let me put it this way more straight. Um, 
It's ironic because Hume lambasts theists and Christians who believe in miracles and that sort of thing on the basis of testimony. And he says, look, you guys are more interested in rhetorical wit and rhetorical merit, as uh, uh, other philosophers would call it, and you're bamboozled by that. You don't care about logic or reasoning or something like that. Well, this proves it's the exact opposite. Um, you know, Hume's got quite a lot of rhetorical wit here. No test, he's got his maxim, famous words. No testimony is sufficient unless the testimony uh, and the falsehood of that testimony would be even more miraculous and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, you get, uh, you know, he's good with words here, but the irony is from a logical perspective, he's a twit. Uh, he doesn't know about Bayes' theorem. He doesn't understand the probability calc calculus and all the factors you have to get to get an overall probability to believe or disbelieve. Uh, you can't just look at that one factor, which is what he does in his premise one, just that prior probability of uh, uh, the hypothesis that a, a miracle happened or that miracle claim is true, uh, not good enough. So yeah, uh, moving on. Um, so let's move on to stage two. Okay, so that covers all my objections to David Hume's in principle argument uh, that, you know, even if miracles happened in principle, or sorry, uh, in principle, we could never accept testimonial evidence over and against our experiential evidence. Uh, the experiential evidence that the laws of nature are not violated by miracles uh, is much, much stronger than um, any, any and all testimonial evidences that are even possible attesting to a miracle. We've just proven that complete rubbish. Uh, his argument's an absolute failure right now. But Hume's not done failing because now he, <laughs> um, now he has his in fact argument. Um, and remember he gave uh, in premise four of his argument, he gave four reasons as to why he says, but look, um, even if my in principle argument is bad enough for you Christians and theists, you miracle believers, you, but the testimonial evidence isn't even strong in real life. The actual testimonial evidence for miracles is garbage and rubbish, according to Hume. And he gives four reasons. Number one, the actual witnesses are not good enough. Number two, human beings have motivating psychological factors to lie. Um, and number three, only ignorant, savage, barbarian, or primitive peoples um, attest to miracle claims. Civilized countries and peoples like me we never see any of these mer alleged miracles. And then finally, fourthly, there are con miracle claims in, within contradictory religious traditions. So these are just four reasons that he says the testimony, testimonial evidence that we have in reality is garbage. It's, it's not even, not only would you be destroyed because the experiential evidence would overwhelm you if you had good testimonial evidence, but you, in fact, you don't have good testimonial evidence. You've got poor or garbage testimonial evidence, and these are the four reasons why Hume thinks so. Um, so let me, uh, and then therefore it's hyper, there's this conclusion. So here's my assessment of this. Um, so in terms of premise four, it's obvious that Hume's bias causes him to beg the question. He's being viciously circular. The only reason he accepts this premise is because he already accepts the conclusion and that's obvious. Uh, and you can tell from his writings, it's a little bit of psychoanalyzing, but everyone who's read Hume kind of comes up with this, whether they're atheist, agnostic or not. We, it's, it's just dripping the bias of this guy. Um, but yeah, he, you know, first of all, in this premise, he just assumes, look, all miracle claims are all alike. They're all equally poor. Um, and this is just rubbish. I'm sorry. If, if you've got a functioning brain in your head, you need to look at the evidence for every single individual miracle claim. You're not allowed to just dismiss them all generally. You have to look at the evidence and see what the differences are. You can't just assert and assume that all miracle claims are equally or, or on the same level, uh, evidentially speaking, or at, or at the very least uh, at a certain poor level or below that uh, level. No, you have to evaluate them on the merits or demerits. David Hume hasn't done that. He's, he's intellectually lazy. He hasn't done the work to actually evaluate 
the miracle claims and the actual evidence, testimonially or otherwise, that we have. Um, okay, so what are his reasons? So number one, his first reason here is that the actual witnesses are not good enough. He outlines this on page 302. Look, you'll never have uh, enough witnesses. You want multiple witnesses who are educated, who are of um, um, uh, unpeckable moral fiber and integrity and uh, sufficiently knowledgeable and, and all of that stuff to test, to be reliable in what they're testifying to. You know, maybe you'll have a witness who's an idiot and he, he doesn't know about magic tricks. And I witnessed a, a person levitating if you were properly educated. Yeah, but that's because there's a hidden pole under their robes keeping them up. You, you know that, right? No. Um, or maybe you just have one and, as opposed to many and stuff like that. Well, the problem with this is, number one, Hume's demand is too onerous and requires almost like the perfect man, an ideal, an ideal witness, man or woman, um, in order to work. And this is just unreasonable. I mean, God performs miracles for real people in the real world with flaws and all this stuff. And God has, I mean, God is omniscient, omnipotent, uh, omnibenevolent. He would know how to make the real average people recognize and appreciate miracles. We don't need the testimony of these ideal people. It's not necessary in order to believe testimonial evidence. Um, you know, there's obviously some lesser standard that's sufficient for that. Um, so this is, it's too onerous and not necessary, I would say. Secondly, um, in terms of multiple witnesses, we do have cases with multiple, not just multiple, but independent, therefore very good, reliable witnesses. And as we'll see, this is the case with uh, Christianity and the attesting of Jesus' resurrection. Absolute proof. We, it's a criterion of authenticity histor in historiography and biblical studies. We've got uh, multiple independent, provably independent witnesses. Right in the Gospels or in Paul's letters, uh, we've got certain traditions, hymns, creeds, sermon summaries, uh, stuff like that. The historians, secular historians, are able to trace back to the oral period and back to historically authentic oral traditions from the time of Jesus. Yes, the Gospels may have been aware of each other to some extent, and yes, they were written decades later, but the traditions within them we can identify are historically accurate using the historical criteria of authenticity, things like the criterion of embarrassment, stuff like that. And through that, one of those criterion is multiple independent witnesses or testimony. And we have that in spades in terms of Christian miracle uh, claims and the testimony provided in our written historical sources. Um, heck, it's even more than just multiple independent sources that can be identified going back to the eyewitnesses We've got multiple independent forms of these as well. We've, like I said, we've got hymns or creeds and um, you know this, uh, stuff like that. Uh, in addition to just straightforward prose or whatever, attesting to the events. Um, so yeah, Hume, Hume is just foolish in assuming that the actual witnesses are not good enough. No, we can prove that they are good enough. Um, are they ideal? Uh, do they necessarily do the witnesses stand up to all of Hume's unreasonable demands? Um, I don't know. I again, you have to evaluate them on an individual basis, but I would say no, even the best, even with Christianity, the witnesses for the resurrection or testimony about Jesus' resurrection historically, uh, which is the best attested miracle in all of human history, uh, based on my detailed decade long research with. The world's experts, Mike Lacona, Gary Habermas, uh, and others, uh, Tony Costa, Sean McDowell, um, stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, um, I still don't think it meets Hume's ideal witnesses, but it, again, I would, his ideal witnesses are not necessary. There's this lower standard that's sufficient, and the testimony of Christ, the Christian miracles is su provably sufficient in at least some cases, I would say. Okay, so let me move on to the next bit here. Uh, just hold on one second. All right, so we're back um, again. Um, so yeah, so I want to share my screen where we're looking at David Hume's in fact argument. 
and I refuted his first uh, reason for thinking that the actual testimony that we have is poor based on the quality of insufficient witnesses or insufficient um, <clears throat> testimony. Let's bring that up. Uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, and I said that actually Hume's criteria for uh, an ideal witness are too strong. They're not necessary to have a sufficient uh, testimonial evidence. We do have sufficient testimonial evidence in the case of Christianity, at least. Um, and you have to evaluate that on an individual basis for each miracle claim, if it's sufficient or not. Um, <clears throat> so looking at Hume's second reason, he basically says, well, look, human beings in general have this motivating psychological drive to lie, to make up miracle stories in particular, because oh, it makes us look cool and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think this is a general fact. Yeah, we do want to make up supernatural stuff. But <clears throat> there are problems with this. So, number one, this general truth doesn't do anything to take away it from particular cases of miracle claims. We've got to evaluate the evidence the individual miracle claims. Just because there's this general motivation, we also have a general tendency to tell the truth as human debts. So what's the problem? Um, well, um, by looking at it, actually, you could try and figure out that, well, there are some particular cases of miracles where we have they have an overwhelming psychological motivation not to lie. And in case, and in fact, this is the case we have with Christianity and the testimony to Jesus resurrection via the appearances to the apostles there are at least three reasons that prove this that they had this motivation not to lie number one they were willing to die I didn't say that they died or were martyred I've seen Dr. Sean McDowell's great PhD work for example on the martyrdom of the apostles maybe at best we can prove four out of the 12 were killed as martyrs um, and there's a lot of scholarly work that went into it his, uh, his uh, book there and everything. But we can prove, as Gary Habermas says, that they were willing to suffer and die for their belief specifically that Jesus died and rose from the dead and appeared to them. And what's unique here is that they're not just like some Muslim in 9-11 who mindlessly and blindly believes that Allah will give, put him into paradise, so therefore he's willing to die. And in fact, he did provably die. Uh, by ramming those planes into the Twin Towers, for example, or into the Pentagon, uh, totally irrelevant. Because in the case of the apostles in Christianity, we're not talking some Muslim willing to die thousands of years after the fact. He's in no position to know whether Muhammad split the moon in half. Irrelevant. Christianity, not irrelevant. We have witnesses who are in a position to know that the supernatural miracle took place. They were the eyewitnesses. They saw Jesus' resurrection appearances, and that was their basis for their proclamation and of their willingness to die for their belief. Key difference. No other religion on the planet has anything like that. Um, so, yeah, anyways. Um, and also, uh, furthermore, as religious Jews, the apostles had very, very strong, massively overwhelming any earthly benefits that David Hume wants to say that, well, their motivation is to lie. Yeah, temporal earthly garbage compared to the eternal heavenly benefits being in God's presence that the these religious Jews, Peter and the other apostles, they would have had strong theological motivations not to lie. Jesus never supernaturally and miraculously rose from the dead and appeared to his apostles. They would have believed oh, he died on the cross and the Bible, the Old Testament tells us, as Paul quotes, anyone who dies on a tree or a cross is cursed. You get crucified, you're cursed by God. There's no way they would lie and say, oh, well, he was, uh, he was the Messiah. He rose from the dead. Uh, you know, give me your money. No. They would have been like, I do that. I go to hell. I'm on Satan's team, not God's team. So, yeah, that, it's just laughable. And Again, you have to evaluate this in other religions too. Each individual miracle claim on its own merits. I'm just giving this one example of Jesus' resurrection. That's one that David Hume himself highlights. So that's why I feel warranted in bringing that one up. Um, not just being biased as a Christian theist here. Um, so yeah, so willing to die for their belief and they were in a position to know. 
Number two, they had strong theological motivations not to lie, namely they would be damned to hell if they did lie about it or on the side of Satan rather than God. And finally, um, there's a good case to be made that they weren't just tricked, deluded. They didn't have an illusion, delusion, or hallucination of some kind based on medical evidence. And, you know, Gary Habermas, Michael Cohen have done great work on that. They've consulted actual real experts in these areas. I myself contacted the world's experts in hallucinations and, and confirmed uh, a lot of the research, which I'll be sharing at some point. And uh, we have a medical expert, uh, Dr. Joseph Bergeron, who I will be coming on my show as a guest. And I'm, I'll be interviewing them all about this stuff, uh, the evidence for the resurrection, uh, what happened, ex explanations, as well as his take on the Shroud of Turin and the medical perspective on the Shroud of Turin specifically. Uh, so yeah, I look forward to Dr. Joseph Bergeron being on the show and giving his refutations of some of these psychology-based theories for explaining the resurrection appearances. Um, so yeah, in that light, I think we have very good reasons to say that well, with this Christian miracle of Jesus rising from the dead by God, that's reliable testimony. There was no motivating psychological factor for witnesses to lie. We have defeated this defeater of Hume's. Hume has not provided, remember, under the testimonial anti-reductionist then, we believe testimony unless and until someone presents us with an undefeated defeater to doubt or to disbelieve it. Hume's attempting to give us four defeaters. Are they undefeated? Well, we saw number one is easily destroyed and defeated. Um, although it, it does give us caution. I, I, I don't wanna say that number one factor is irrelevant, but there are some provable cases that meet, his, uh, that, meet that criteria of having good enough witnesses. Secondly, he says, oh, but human beings have a general psychological uh, motivation to lie about supernatural stuff. They, and, and you know they do it all the time. Well, not in the case of Jesus and his disciples in terms of the resurrection. They had good, overwhelming reasons not to lie in that case. And that defeats David Hume's second defeater here that he's trying to think, because we can prove that they did not have that motivating reason. Um, okay, so. Okay, and uh, just by the way, in terms of what I'm saying here about uh, we have a defeater for this defeater. It's a rebutting defeater. We, I, I personally have actually done all the research. I've done my religious research for more than a decade and that sort of thing, um, including working personally with my friend, Dr. Gary Habermas, the world's expert, one of the world's experts, Mike Lacona and, and others, um, Dr. Tony Costa and that sort of thing. And I, I can prove what I'm saying in terms of these three defeaters, defeaters, so to speak. So I'm not just saying this off the top of my head. I've, I've actually done the work to prove it. And I've got about uh, a 250 page. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not gonna post, post that up because it's very rough uh, work, it's color coded. I will be eventually, once I finish my Shroud solo shows and write up on that, revision I'll write up. Um, I'll be working on my vindic short vindication argument that'll be done very quickly. And then I'm gonna be turning to my next in terms of my Christian evidence series, the next objective evidence after the shroud is done and that quick few months vindication argument or less, uh, and vindication prediction argument that I have as my second objective evidence, the third objective evidence is going to be the historical evidence for the resurrection. So that's going to be another long series like my shroud one where I'm looking at the historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection. And I'm going to back up my claims right now is including these three defeaters for uh, David Shim original defeater about the motivating factor. So I'm not just talking nonsense here. Um, I can back up my claims. And uh, if you don't believe me, hey, I'm not the only one. My betters, Dr. Gary Habermas has written lots of books. He's working on his mo uh, MO right now. Um, and uh, Mike Lacona, he's written his 700 page book. Uh, not only these guys, William Lane Craig, Caleb Jackson has got an excellent book. Um, he's not a scholar yet, but my goodness, that that kid does uh, that guy does scholarly work. Um, you know, so I've posted up his thing. Andrew Loke's book on the resurrection, uh, Richard Swinburne, I posted his stuff on the resurrection. I'll probably do that, including the blog, because that's relevant. So I'll put Richard Swinburne's 
work on the resurrection in the the blog for this show for you guys um to read that and um yeah so so we've established this we've got rebutting provable rebutting defeaters to defeat david's Hume, david hume's defeater here about the motivating factors uh, and oh i'm not sharing my screen okay uh, about these uh, motivate these defeaters for this defeater, right? I can prove these rebutting defeaters, and they rebut David Hume's defeater for believing the testimony. It's not an undefeated defeater. Uh, so that's a, that's enough defeaters. You guys are getting confused probably. So let's let's move on to the next one. David Hume's third reason for thinking that the actual testimonial evidence we have is garbage and rubbish. Well, he says, well, look. Miracle claims are only made by the ignorant and barbarous people of the world. The ancient Hebrews in the Bible, these guys were in know nothing, <laughs> were know nothing. Uh, uh, I was going to say a word, but that's um, th th these guys were know nothings. Um, people in Africa in, during Hume's time, India, you know, all part of this, the far flung regions of the British Empire, these guys are primitive, uh, savage barbarians. They're ignorant, superstitious. They're idiots in, in Hume's view. You know, they're underdeveloped. So of course, miracle, and where is it that these tales of miracles happen to abound? Only in these places. It, they never get reported in civilized places like where I live in Scotland as part of the British Empire among us, uh, white people and stuff like that. We, we uh, we're civilized, we're smart, we're intelligent, we're not superstitious, we're reasonable. Uh, not like these other people that report miracles. So that's Hume's third thing. So what do we say by assessment? Number one, problems. David Hume, racist pig, provably. Um, look, uh, being less biased, David Hume was a product of his time. Uh, he, he engaged in ethnocentrism. He thought he was better than these other people, at, at the very least in terms of his anti-supernatural reasoning and logic. And he saw other races or other areas where miracle claims were more prevalent, at least in his mind. Um, and he saw that as proof that, yeah, that's why you can't trust miracle claims. If miracles were really happening, we would have claims in te miracle testimony where I live in my civilized area of the world. Um, so obviously this is just racist um, and biased. Um, there's been a lot of work. Dr. Craig Keener has done, uh, he's written his two volume book. Um, great book. Again, Craig Keener, he was a friend of mine. He was on my show. Uh, I invited him on my show once to talk about Acts, but he's written a two volume work on miracles, documenting it from around the world and how smart people in these underdeveloped regions were, these so called ignorant and barbarous peoples. Um, they weren't so, if you, if you weren't a racist and biased, you actually met them, they were pretty civilized. They were very civilized. That they, they were different. There was huge differences in that sort of thing. And I, I think in, in some sense, I understand where the primitive uh, notions came from. They, they didn't have the same technology. The West was superior, right? The British Empire was a hyperpower in David Hume's time. Hyperpower as defined by Amy Chua, um, who's a lawyer, and, and she wrote a, a book on hyperpowers. Hyperpower is beyond a superpower. It means everyone, no one in the world can defeat you. You are the top of the crop militarily, um, economically, and technologically, and all of that. There's no doubt the British Empire in David Hume's time was the hyperpower of the day. So they were, in some ways, superior in a way. Um, but that's a far cry from saying, oh, well, these guys were just ignorant. There's been tons of documentaries showing what these so-called ignorant and barbarous people were capable of and the complex societies, civilizations that they had. Um, so yeah, they, it's just pure racism on Hume's part to paint them in this way. Um, it's, it's, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not true. Secondly, uh, the other objection, it's just not true that there were no reports of miracles in the civil, in the so-called civilized world either. No, there were tons of miracle reports in David Hume's day. He just dismissed them biasly, begging that question, just dismissing them. Hume would it should have known about it. Not only that, they continue to this day in de so-called developed countries and civilized, quote, quote unquote, what Hume would call civilized nations, 
they're everywhere. We do have miracle claims. Um, and again, Craig Keener documents these and they, they've been uh, miracle claims, I think, miracle healings and stuff that are credibly proven, published in peer reviewed medical journals. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of work on that. Caleb Jackson, my friend, he's writing his book on miracles right now. He's done lots of research um, and he's found some incredible things, including the healing of amputees. You hear these godless atheists and skeptics so we, you know, on the internet thinking they're smart. Oh, why doesn't God heal amputees? Well, my friend, talk to Caleb Jackson. He does. Oops, you messed up. But of course, like Hume, atheists of today are totally ignorant and they, they just dismiss. They just assert and assume that there are no such cases because they personally have never heard of it. It's kind of like uh, that story about, oh, you know, some guy never heard of ice or seen snow. He lives in the tropics. So some guy gives him testimony about ice and snow. Ah, you're, you're stupid. I don't believe that. There's no such thing. Nothing in my experience can, can attest to snow or ice. Get out of here. Uh, and oops, you're a fool, uh, Mr. Tropics guy. Ice and snow exists. Just because it's not in your experience, irrelevant. Um, so yeah, I, I think that David Hume was just biased and closed-minded, and he dismissed evidence, and he was intellectually lazy. He was hasty. He didn't pay attention to miracle claims that were even in his backyard, so to speak. Maybe not in his intellectual elitist circles, maybe. Um, I have to admit, uh, look, I would be an intellectual elitist, so to speak. I'm more in David Hume's uh, camp experientially. I've never experienced a miracle. I've never experienced a supernatural event apart from a few instances of promptings, I would say, from the, the Holy Spirit. Um, but yeah, I've never had any anything that I would define as a miracle uh, in the truest sense of the word, like a miracle, you know, as, as a sign, operating as a sign uh, that Christianity is true or something, I, you know, uh, charismatic movements or um, I don't know, a healing or something like this, or an experience with an angel or a demon. Um, I've had nothing personally of that that I can attest to. Um, so yeah, um, I, in my, I'm in the same boat as David Hume. The difference though is I'm not so arrogant as to presume that because I've never experienced that, my experience is the universal truth. I'm just gonna dismiss any and all claims of miracles that I've heard or, or gotten from others or, or reports altogether. Um, I think that's where Hume goes wrong with this one. And like I said, you want proof? Read Craig Keener's two-volume book on miracles. He details hundreds of, what was I thinking? I should have said like thousands, possibly even tens of thousands of cases from around the world and of various things. And what I like about Craig Keener, he cites, look, this is an disputable secular scholarship in anthropology there's no doubt because in anthropology they don't assess or evaluate miracle claims they just record them and the, yeah there's no doubt that miracles happen all around the world everywhere uh people report these or give testimony to these kinds of things all the time and you know keener he even gives examples in hume's day hume could have been aware of these uh in hume's atmosphere if he was open-minded and actually considering it, but really Hume is just biased. He's been infected by the deists of his day. And look, it's no secret, Protestants and Catholics are kind of to blame for people like David Hume because we started it, right? When Protestantism happened, oh, Catholics have all these superstitions and fake relics and fake uh, miracle claims. And we, ha ha, you, you know, you, uh, what, did, um, what do they call them in Ireland? They're Catholics or something like that. You guys are so gullible and superstitious and stupid for believing that these are all fake. On the other end, Catholics fought back in the Counter Reformation. They, they would fight back against the Protestants, you prods. And uh, again, that's an Ireland thing, from my understanding. They, they, it's an ad hominem towards both sides. You know, oh, you guys are so gullible. You believe in your Protestant miracles. You're you're dismissing all these provable ones. We actually have rigorous standards. Our, you know, we have authorities that investigate our miracles. You guys have no one. You guys just bark around, bark like dogs, cluck like chickens. You guys are fools. Um, so it's it's actually Christians um, to blame. Ultimately, we started it. Protestants and Catholics fighting with each other, dismissing each other's miracle claims. 
uh, without due warrant. I think there, there, we have proof that there was a lot of fake Catholic miracles and relics, stuff like that. I even had Dr. Cheryl White, who's a world's expert, a, a historian of the medieval period. And she even had said, yeah, the vast majority of these things are all fake and stuff like that. There's a lot of fakes uh, and vice versa. Protestants, I'm sure, may uh, definitely, provably make false claims. I witnessed some false claims. I went to a charismatic church and I witnessed a lot of fakery going on there. Um, and, you know, in terms of so-called supernatural uh, possession by the Holy Spirit and making them do stuff. No, sorry, I, it, it was fake. Um, but yeah, so, so we kind of started it. That led to the deist movement. And then Hume is borrowing a lot from the deists. Uh, the deists just, look, all of this merit, for, for Protestant, Catholic, I, it's all the same garbage. Just throw them all in the garbage. Um, they're all the same. And Hume is just adopting that. Um, as I said, Caleb Jackson is working on his book, uh, his great book on miracles. I don't think it's out yet, but when it is, definitely support him because he has put so much time, research, and effort into it. So he deserves uh, some good credit for that. Also, um, I just wanted to give you guys kind of a one specific example here. So I'm a Protestant. Um, I'm biased against Catholicism. I, I don't think that Catholicism is true. Um, I, I even, um, while I have a lot of Catholic friends uh, and one Eastern Orthodox friend, and I, I believe I'm a religious inclusivist, so I believe that if you're a Catholic, um, you can be saved. Um, but I have questions about if you're a Catholic and you follow the proper doctrine, um, I'm not 100% sure. Like if you understand uh, you're a real seeker, you understand the, the official Catholic doctrine fully, and you subscribe to all of that, um, I think you might be damned. Like, I think the Pope might be going to hell um, because he's smart. He understands it and stuff. Obviously, God is is the ultimate judge. He knows the heart and stuff. So may, maybe the Pope's a real seeker and he just uh, really has got it wrong despite having access to all this stuff. Again, God judges in the end. But the point that I'm making here is I, I would have um, a bias against miracles that seem to support Catholicism, but I have to admit uh, the Catholics have done a great job at certain miracle sites like Lourdes, and I believe that there have been certain miracle healings that were supernatural or miraculous and took place there, uh, and that we can prove it. And a couple of these were even published in peer-reviewed medical journals. Um, two of which I actually posted on one of my earlier blogs. If I can find them, I'll post them again. But it was on, I think it was on my Miracle Show Part 3, where I had Robert L. White and Matthew Taylor. So if you look there, you can see that. But the point I want to make is, look, look at the rigorous criteria that the Catholic Church operates at Lourdes. Um, All right, so look, this is what they require. Um, full medical documentation of one's prior condition must be provided, including any and all hospital records, if any. Also, the medical bureau, the medical bureau of, of the site at Lord's for the New England Catholic Church is not made up of just Christians. They actually seek out atheists, agnostics, uh, naturalists, um, Protestants, any they seek out and prefer people who are biased against Catholics on this medical bureau. Um, that's not to say they don't have Catholic medical experts. Of course they do. Um, but you're just biased if you say, oh, you just dismiss them like a bunch of Catholics. No, they, they bring on medical experts from all persuasions onto this thing and actively seek non-Catholics medical experts. So anyways, so they need this. The Medical Bureau must be allowed to document the post condition. So that means their own medical experts, after you've been healed, they have to examine you personally. Um, there have to be contact with multiple eyewitnesses to confirm or corroborate the prior medical condition and various details pertaining to the person's character. So they rigorously interview people about you, multiple eyewitnesses for you. The cure must be certified to be organic in that no medicine, 
and or medical technology that can potentially naturally cure the prior condition was used before or after the healing, and the healing must be deemed to be medically inexplicable by the medical professional, professionals on the medical bureau. Finally, the cure must endure or persist over time. Typically, they follow up for years afterwards, even decades in some cases, uh, just to ensure that the cure has persisted fully. Uh, so it, it's not even good enough if you have a partial return. And this requires further medical confirmation to the fact, as well as interviewing and keeping up with the eyewitness friends and family who keep in touch with you to make sure, yes, the cure is still there. Um, so this is pretty, pretty good, decent standards, I would say, for investigating miracle claims. This is what the Catholic Church does at Lourdes. And this is what they have to have before they'll say, this was a miraculous healing by the church. They've had like hundreds of thousands of cases of testimony of miraculous healing at the site. The Catholic Church doesn't just mindlessly or blindly accept these testimonies, right? They're discerning. They've only got, if you look at their website, they've only got maybe about 70 cases that they say, yes, this was a miracle. This was a healing from God, a, a supernatural or miraculous healing. Um, so to just pretend that, oh, they're just biased and religious. Look, I'm not a Catholic. I, I am a hardcore Protestant. And I'm telling you, that's not what they're doing. We've got to be fair and charitable and truthful to the evidence that we have in the testimony the quality of the testimony and the standards that we're um, evaluating, that these people are evaluating the testimony on. And I think there's at least a few cases that convince me something's going on there. Um, so yeah, so that's what we'll say there. So let's go back to the slides. All right, so reason number four, the last in fact, re the last reason for his in fact argument, say, arguing that the testimony is garbage. <laughs> um, so this is the, the one that says, look, there's contradictory miracle claims in various religions. And this is obviously true. We've got in Islam, Muhammad split in the moon in half. You got miracles in Buddhism, Hinduism, certain forms of Buddhism, certain, um, uh, what else? you know, uh, Sikhs, uh, all various, uh, pretty much all the religions have at least in some for one form or another, have religious miracle claims or testimony of certain miracles taking place. Um, I remember speaking with a Hindu uh, girl one time and asking her why she believed in Hinduism and that sort of thing. And she attested to the famous milk miracle, where you would put milk on a spoon, you would feed it to a, a pagan statue of the pagan god Ganesh. And supposedly the milk disappears, supposedly these elephant headed God or this elephant God is drinking the um, drinking the milk. Now, obviously, there that was proven to be a fraud. There is a easily naturalistic explanation for it. And in fact, that was proven to be true, at least not in all cases, because obviously they didn't study every single person in their homes who did it. I, nobody investigated the, the Hindu girl I was talking to in terms of her case, except for me, just kind of asking and probing questions. But they did investigate the original people who made these claims, and it was proven to be a fraud and that sort of thing. Um, but the point is, yeah, there's, there's competing religious miracles. And Hume says, look, if God is giving miracles proving contradictory things, I think the odds are we shouldn't believe the testimony. We should throw them all out as garbage. These are, these are horrible. We've got this miracle of um, Ganesh and milk. Well, that's horrible. Therefore, every other miracle is Muhammad splitting the moon is horrible. Uh, uh, um, Jesus rising from the dead is horrible. Throw it all out. It's all part of the poison fruit. Uh, that's the way Hume reasons here. So problems. Um, so the first problem here is obviously, look, uh, Hume, you're obviously just being biased here, right? You're just assuming that we need to throw it out and that God is providing contradictory evidence or something like that. But there are multiple interpretations. Even if we grant these miracle testimony claims are equal um, and or that are they are miracles are even taking place, there are different interpretations. Look, number one, maybe God shows goodwill 
toward people of different faiths without that nece necessitating that he's endorsing their contradictory religious beliefs. And I, I've seen this, I've done a lot of work in this in terms of um, my 21 page blog, you can read my take on miracle healings, for example, but there, God does miracles for different purposes, right? It's not always to authenticate a religious message. Those are, that's a subset of miracles. That, those are the types of miracles that I'm most interested in. That's what I've developed my G belief authenticating event criteria or religious authenticating mir miraculous event criteria, right? Using specified complexity. And I say, we can identify God's purpose of authenticating a religion through these types of miracles, but that's just the subset of the overall occurrences of miracles in the world. Um, God can perform miracles for other purposes outside of authenticating a religious message. So for example, at Lourdes, I, I don't think that authenticates Catholicism uh, or the religious message of Catholicism, nor do I even think it authenticates Christianity necessarily in and of itself, um, without, unless uh, you give further argumentation. And, I think Caleb Jackson thinks he's going to provide that in his book. But um, yeah, the, there are Hindus that get healed, miraculously healed. There are atheists. That, that doesn't mean God is endorsing these worldviews and that sort of thing. No, his purpose there is compassion, goodwill towards the people. You know, they prayed and he wants to help them out and stuff like that. And that's what we find from double blind prayer studies. Uh, and miracle healings, they, they don't seem to be correlated to any specific religious message in particular. Uh, they don't function in a, in, to serve to authenticate the religious message in these contexts, uh, at least not with, the provable, with any of the provable ones. There are certain fraudulent miracle claims that do try to authenticate a religious message, but then the thing is we can prove these are fraudulent or naturalistically explained uh, and or they're not explained as a miracle of God, uh, so, you know, a God-designed event, whatever you want to say. There's another interpret, equally valid interpretation of this. Well, look, the, the systems, perhaps the religious systems could be less incompatible than Hume supposes. Hume takes an exclusivist, a religious exclusivist perspective, and he thinks that they're all, the religious truths um, and or salvation are all incompatible and mutually exclusive. What either one or the other is true, or none of them are true. You can't have one or two or more religions both being true because they're contradictory in the religious core religious doctrines that they teach. Now, the problem is Hume is assuming that it, religious exclusivism is true. No, maybe religious inclusivism is true, religious pluralism or religious relativism might be true. And again, I've posted these papers in the past, I'll post them again. Um, and that, and that would allow, inclusivism allows, it's important to note with these religious inclusivism and stuff, they're talking about truth. So Hume would be talking about with respect to religious truths. Um, when it comes to religious truths, believe it or not, I would agree with Hume here. I am a religious exclusivist. I don't think it makes sense to think, speak of religious inclusivism, pluralism, or relativism with respect to religious truths and or even those core truths. Um, exclusivism works there. I agree with Dr. Alvin Plantinga and David Hume and others, and I'll post those papers uh, on my blog for you guys. But when it comes to soteriology, you know, salvation, I'm a religious inclusivist. I can include non-Christians, people who don't meet, uh, at least some people who don't meet the criteria for being a saved Christian are, are going to be saved. People in the Old Testament, as well, people who've never heard of Jesus in the modern days, um, babies that die, perhaps, um, you know, people who, through no fault of their own, just haven't come to saving faith in Jesus Christ specifically and met the New Testament's conditions for salvation, explicit conditions for salvation through in Christ. Um, well, soteriological or salvific religious inclusivism says, I can include some of those. I think the New Testament is clear that that's going to be a, a real minority of people, right? Um, I, I base this inclusivist stance on Romans chapters one to three, where Paul's talking about judging your own, uh, based on your own, the lights of your own heart and stuff like that. Um, I forget the words specifically he uses there, but um, so that's my base for being soteriologically 
inclusive. But again, that's going to be a minority of people. Most people who don't come to a safe knowledge of Christ are damned to hell. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. Secondly, um, I believe that a lot of people have had a sufficient opportunity to come to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ, and they weren't real seekers. And because of that, they're going to be damned. They, they need, they, because they've had access to the propositions that Jesus died and rose from the dead and the data and the evidence. And, um, you know, they've had every opportunity to come there, you know, to the greater, the um, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, the same deal with great God-given gifts or opportunities comes greater responsibility. Um, so people that have ready access to the Bible or translations or scholars, they have more of a responsibility to come to explicit faith in Christ compared to some guy over in Timbuktu who's never even heard of Jesus. No, they could be included in salvation despite never going, I believe Jesus died and rose from the dead, or I explicitly, well, repenting of, of sins, I think, is generally required. Uh, you don't need to use that terminology, but um, yeah. However, salvific inclusivism versus exclusivism isn't in mind here. We're talking strictly with respect to truth values. That's what's relevant to Hume's argument here. And on that front, I would agree with Hume. I would be a religious exclusivist. And if you want to see reasons for that, read Dr. Elvin Plantinga's paper on my blog. I think he does a great job defending that. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to raise that because I agree with Hume. I don't think this is an equally valid interpretation. Although there's another interpretation. Maybe there's multiple supernatural powers and beings at work uh, in various religions. And, you know, in the, in the New Testament itself, it admits demons took on the guise of pagan gods and did certain supernatural works or miraculous, supernatural works, because miraculous requires it to be God. Um, they did supernatural things to trick the pagans and the people foolishly went along with it and said, oh, Zeus, you did this for me and all this stuff, right? Um, we've got to grapple with this. So yeah, um, maybe there are supernatural events that aren't miracles kind of thing in these other religions. So maybe one religion has a miracle, provable miracle of God, whereas other religions have supernatural events but they're not miraculous. We can't prove that they come from God um, as opposed to Satan or something like that. Hume just doesn't even consider that that's a possibility. He just says, well, if there is this quote unquote su supernatural event claims, there's only one person who could do supernatural events and that's God. So he just assumes supernatural equals miraculous. No, supernatural can have multiple kinds. It could be miraculous if it comes from God or it could be either directly or indirectly or it could be through demonic or satanic um, causes and, and stuff. Okay, my next objection is, look, even if there was a good reason to discount mir miraculous testimonies, let's pretend Hume's right. There are, con there, if there are contradicting miraculous claims, he's right. We, sh we shouldn't consider these other interpretations. The proper interpretation is to say they're all wrong and throw them in the garbage. Let's say that's right. Well. Hume still hasn't even proven that this is the case. He hasn't proven that all religious miracle claims or testimonies are equal and or, uh, you know, on, on the same level as whatever mer religious miracle claim you're evaluating. No, may maybe the miracle claims for Christianity are vastly superior and unique relative to the miracle claims of all other religions. I certainly believe this, and I've proven this through my research, um, I'm not the only one. Dr. Gary Habermas has written a great book, and I'll include it on my blog. I've included it before, but he's done how Christ the historical testimonial evidence for Jesus' resurrection is vastly superior and unique compared to all the other world's major religions. And he he's demonstrated that by evaluating what is the testimonial evidence for miracles in these other religions. All these major world religions and he shows Christianity is unique. That's why you have to evaluate particular miracle claims and evaluate them. How strong or weak are they relative to each other? You can't just mindlessly assert and assume like David Hume here that, oh, well, they're all equal in value. They're all equally bad. They're all equally garbage. No, that's bias on Hume's part. 
Okay, so that's it. Uh, thank goodness. So to wrap up in closing, uh, I think I want to leave you guys with a great uh, quote, a paraphrase of a quote by the biblical scholar, Dr. Walter Wink. It's made an impression on me for a decade now, uh, or you know, for uh, since 2015, I guess, um, by Dr. Walter Wink. And I think it's very apt in describing David Hume in his arrogant argument against believing in miracles on the basis of testimonial evidence. So look, he says, people with an attenuated sense of what is possible, like Hume, will bring with them that conviction, will bring that conviction with them to their study of reality and thereby diminish it by the poverty of their experience. Remember that tropics guy, not know his poverty of experience. He's never experienced snow or ice. It's the same deal with Hume here. As a biased, closed-minded, entrenched atheist uh, who won't even consider or be open-minded for a second about miraculous evidence and testimony, um, it's just outside of all of his personal experience, and therefore he dismisses. Because of that attenuated sense of what is possible on his part, uh, he wants to bring that with him to his study, and he diminishes reality uh, by the poverty of his own experience. So yeah, uh, that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. I hope it was helpful. Um, like I said, I wanted to provide something new and unique to this debate and evaluation of David Hume's argument. Obviously, my betters have been there before me, William and Craig and Gary Habermas, Richard Swinburne, people of Michael Kona, they've all evaluated <clears throat> David Hume's argument. And a lot of my, uh, Craig Keener as well, and a lot of my material came from them. A lot of my objections came from my readings of their work already. But I think I've contributed something at least a little bit new, in, especially with that debate in secular philosophy from the epistemology of testimony. What are the different positions and how do we evaluate and utilize testimony as a source of evidence? So I think that's something unique and I hope was interesting for you guys. Um, and I'll send links to the John Greco and uh, Jennifer Lackey papers on that front. But other than that, yeah, have a great week and take care. All right.